Shakespeare's play, Measure for Measure, Angelo, a stern but noble lord, is left in charge of Vienna while Vincentino, the duke, goes away for a spell. At least he pretends to go away, but actually he stays near at hand wearing a disguise. The instant Angelo has power, he tightens up on the laws by condemning to death a man named Claudio, who has fathered a child out of wedlock. Isabella, Claudio's sister, pleads for his life, warning Angelo that judgment from, from God is impartial and that he too may someday find himself in need of the mercy which God provided through Christ. Angelo refuses. Claudio must die. But at the same time, Angelo is smitten by a passionate lust for Isabella herself and offers to spare her brother if only she will allow him to have his way with her. The plot twists and turns and ends with Angelo being exposed and facing the death that he so richly deserves. But the Duke, weaving the threads of the story together, pardons one and all, while at the same time, a deep and rich justice is done. With our reading for this week, we come to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. In chapter 5, Jesus taught about God's priorities in the Beatitudes. In chapter 6, he taught about prayer and forgiveness. And today, in chapter 7, he begins to wrap up his famous sermon with a short discussion on treating others the way we ourselves wish to be treated, beginning with our tendency to judge each other at the drop of a hat. So far, things have been pretty manageable, at least as far as our understanding goes. But today, Jesus opens with the line, do not judge so that you may not be judged. And right away, things start to become just a little bit fuzzy. Because what seems like a simple statement is actually pretty complex. Judging is part of the human perception. We judge all of the time. Judgments are essential to our survival, necessary in fact. If we didn't make judgments about people, places, and things, we'd quickly find ourselves in some pretty dangerous situations. Nevertheless, many good Christian people take this to mean that we should never judge anyone ever, which not only sets us up for immediate failure, but also tends to reinforce a sense that the Bible is out of touch with everyday life and that Jesus offers an impossible ethic. But when we set aside biblical literalism and turn instead to a more interpretive reading, the first thing that we notice is that commanding people to never judge actually terminates the rest of the sermon. In the next verse, Jesus advises that a rigorous self-judgment be made before judging others. He says, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly enough to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. A process that clearly involves an analysis of good and bad. And then he says, do not give what is holy to dogs and do not throw your pearls before swine, which is Jesus' way of saying that holy things are not to be repeatedly offered to those who continually reject and even profane them. But again, the only way to sort out who's a swine or who's a dog would be to dig a little deeper in order to determine what is good and what is bad. So right away, it's pretty obvious, the first two verses are not meant to be taken literally. Because if we take them literally, then we can't take anything else that Jesus said seriously. Because nearly everything contained in the whole of Scripture is about teaching people to make judgments or discernments about how they live in relation to God's purposes. In the previous chapter, Jesus made judgments about synagogue practices, long and wordy prayers, and lives that were focused on material goods. 
In 1 John 4, 1, we read, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because false prophets have gone out into the world. John 7, 24 advises, stop judging by mere appearances. Make a right judgment. The message is clear. Christians have an obligation to exercise critical judgment or moral discernment. Jesus was not telling his listeners to stop making judgments. He was telling them to avoid making a specific kind of judgment, the kind that is hypercritical and condemning. In fact, the Greek verb used in the passage could just as easily have been translated as condemnation. He was telling them that we have to pay attention to the kinds of judgment that we make. We have to scrutinize our methods and our motives. We have to work on getting that super annoying log out of our own eye before going to work on that little piece of sawdust in someone else's eye. It takes a lot of practice if we are to distinguish between moral discernment and personal condemnation. Moral discernment is constructive. Hypercritical condemnation is destructive. The hypercritical spirit revels in criticism for its own sake. It expects to find fault. And when it discovers fault in another, it feels a malignant satisfaction and always sees the worst possible motives in the actions of others. And while that might seem like a, an easy enough distinction to make, this critical, judgmental, condemning spirit is so common to the human situation that it's harder to spot than we think. And the line dividing the two can become blurred before you know it. The media, social relationships, our schooling and our work situations are immersed in it. And when you're on the receiving end, it feels pretty awful, doesn't it? Few things are more exhausting and debilitating than harsh, unloving criticism. But nevertheless, we all dish it out. From the guy who cuts us off in traffic to the offbeat person who's not picking up on the social cues that we're sending to the hard-drinking neighbor, it's so easy to judge. So Jesus ups the ante in the second verse by saying, for with the judgment you make, you will be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. This is important, not in the eschatological sense, not as in God's going to be waiting for us at the pearly gates with a scorecard in hand, but because the judgment that we pass on someone else will come back to haunt us kind of like the spirit of judgment's past, which is what Angelo learned in Shakespeare, Shakespeare's play, Measure for Measure. The reality that we create in our minds about what is justified and ethical and good always shows up in our daily living. The faults in others which offend you the most are in all probability your own fault shining right back at you through the mirror of the other. There's a story about a man who was looking for a place to settle when he drove into a rural community. He happened upon an old farmer and he asked him what kind of people live there. In reply, the farmer asked the man, stranger, what kind of people live in the community that you come from? The man said, oh, they're bad people. Gossip, slanders, cheapskates. The old farmer shook his head and he told the man, well, you might as well move on because that's the kind of people that live here too. Later on, another man came through looking for a place to live and he asked that same old farmer about the people, what are the people like who live here? And the farmer asked right back, how are the people where you came from? And the man said, they're wonderful, simply wonderful. They were thoughtful, kind, and loving. I sure was sad to leave them. And the farmer smiled and said, well, unload, stranger, because that's the kind of people that you're going to find here. <laughs>
The problem with judging another human being is that we have so much about ourselves that can be judged. There's another story about a young couple who moved into a new neighborhood. The next morning while they were eating breakfast, the young woman saw her neighbor hanging her washing outside. That laundry is not very clean. She doesn't know how to wash correctly. Perhaps she needs better laundry soap. Her husband looked on, remaining silent. Every time her neighbor hung her washing out to dry, the wo woman made the same comments. A month later, the woman was surprised to see a nice clean wash on the line and said to her husband, look, she's finally learned how to wash correctly. I wonder who taught her this. The husband replied, I got up early this morning and cleaned our windows. <laughs> <laughs> and so it is with life. What we see when watching others depends on the clarity of the window through which we look. The measure by which we judge is the measure by which we ourselves will be judged. The extent to which we judge our neighbor is the extent to which we ourselves will be judged. The reality that we create in our minds about what is justified and ethical and good will be imposed back onto us in our daily living. And if our reality is a projection of judgment, then we will be subjected to that judgment when we approach the basis of Christ and the voices of God that meet us along the narrow paths of our daily living. Jesus sets high expectations for his followers to live an exemplary faith. But he also knows that we are going to fail repeatedly. He knows that we're going to judge. He knows that we will forget about the golden rule. And he knows that chances are good that we will not find the narrow gate because we are each of us simultaneously sinners and saints. But in the middle of it all sits grace. Jesus says, ask, seek, knock. And that's where things start to get organic and real. We need to hear Jesus' words, but we also need to see touch, taste, and smell the works of the kingdom. We need to experience God's kingdom within a community, in relationship with each other, and we need to act. In acting, Jesus' teachings is not about getting it right. It's about working to get it right. It's about asking, seeking, and knocking over and over and over again until we get better, until we improve. That's why we call these things faith practices. These words of Jesus from his Sermon on the Mount that have carried us through the weeks of Epiphany are the flesh that we are called to put on the bones of our mission seeking a deeper spirituality, and changing God's world one act of love at a time. So as we move forward through the days, weeks, months, and years together, let us seek first the kingdom of God while yearning for the righteous judgment that comes with it. Let us seek to build our houses on a firm foundation by heeding and acting on his words. And let the words of Jesus' compassion and justice and forgiveness and love become flesh and dwell among us. May it be with you all according to God's word. Amen. Amen.